Okay, so welcome. Um, uh, I'll present uh, our work, uh, Bokat and my work on deep learning uh, that meets postmodern poetry. Um, and um, this is actually a, a really nice collaboration, a collaborative experience. Uh, Bokat Meyer Sikendiek, uh, who is at Freie Universität Berlin, um, and he's a humanities scholar. Um, uh, has been a, a humanities scholar for some time and um, was interested in working with digital poetry. Um, and so he approached me and, and we then developed this project together, which was uh, eventually funded by Volkswagen Stiftung. And um, this, um, this program uh, by Volkswagen Stiftung, uh, Mixed Methods in the Humanities, actually called for exactly what this workshop for, calls for, for a collaboration between uh, computer science or well, the digital side, I should say. Um, and I'm more or less a pure uh, NLP and CS person. Uh, and the humanities side. Um, so um, uh, we developed this project, which ran over three years, um, to look at postmodern poetry um, with, uh, um, with a data-driven perspective and using CS methods and NLP methods, um, and uh, eventually ended up with deep learning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, um, we looked at postmodern poetry, and postmodern poetry is actually a very difficult genre um, because um, it kind of tries to overcome rules. Um, you always want to create something novel, also in terms of all the structural rules that you'd otherwise have in poetry. Um, you want to play with language, um, and you also want to play with the spoken realization of the poem. So, some uh, poems I think that we had in our original project proposal would be impossible to print um, because, you know, at some time the, the, the writing just evolves into a picture. Um, others, where the writing does evolve into a picture, you can still print. Um, so those were actually accessible to us. Um, so we were looking at postmodern poetry and there, particularly at the, at the uh, structures that exist despite the fact that um, the scholars try to overcome rules, try to overcome existing structures. Um, and um, the second part of the research problem is that even the largest collections of postmodern poetry, if you ask me as a computer scientist, are tiny, right? Um, so there is um, very, very little data. We ended up having a few thousand poems at most, um, uh, but there is this you know, very complex structure which is only latently available. You don't see it openly. Um, so that's how it really becomes very, very interesting. Um, you know, it is, way too much for, for one humanist scholar to, to browse through and digest and have in your mind present at one moment and be able to uh, make statements about it. Um, and at the same time, it's very, very little um, for, um, for computational analysis. Um, so the research questions were um, to relate poetic prosodic theories um, of postmodern poetry to our collection of poems. So there is uh, some uh, theory about this for English language uh, postmodern poetry, and we wanted to uh, scale it, that over to German poetry um, and do this um, on, a, uh, on a corpus based perspective. Um, and the research questions from the computer science side here, um, and I want to stress this that, that there's also a research question from the computer science side, right? The idea is not merely um, to try to use computers in humanities, but also um, to use humanities as a new field for applying computers and data science. So um, there the research question is, how can we actually work with so little data and so sparse data and still get good results or meaningful results? Um, and then we were hoping for new insights from the automatic classification, kind of like turning digital humanities into database humanities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, we were lucky. Um, so uh, we heard earlier that data is always crap. That is true in general. Um, but we were lucky to work with uh, Lyric Line, which is a web page um, featuring postmodern poetry um, spoken um, by the original authors. And um, they are running a database already. So 
<coughs> the data is still may still be crap, but it's at least sorted. Um, so um, we were lucky to um, get all the metadata and be able to browse this data in a, in a meaningful way. Um, and um, what we then did was to, to add to it um, a text audio alignment so that we know who is um, or when is uh, are which words being spoken. Um, and uh, Burkhardt uh, largely went uh, through the poems and assigned classes um, or assigned, assigned those to classes. And I'll, I'll come to issues with that later. Um, first, focusing on, on uh, 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 fewer classes and, and later, you know, he, he got really involved in it and ended up with something like 30 classes. Um, and then the solution is um, that we look at the speech and the text, um, which hadn't been done before. Um, and in order to be able to relate the way um, that a poem is being spoken, um, to the literary classification. So there, uh, if you think about enjambments in, in poems, um, you can have different types where the enjambment is either, you know, just spoken, you know, as a regular end of a line, or there's a spe special, special emphasis on it, or it's basically just lo lost and wrapped around. Um, and of course, you can't see that from the textual structure. Um, you might know that a particular author has meant it this way or the other, um, but from the audio, you can actually hear it. Uh, um, so we were hoping to build a machine that can do the same to, to hear, uh, for example, uh, the way that enjambments are being spoken. Um, and um, to be able to do this, um, we actually had um, to, to build a deep learning based classifier. Um, and uh, we figured out that for the most part, uh, a poem exhibits its features multiple times, basically in every line. Uh, this is of course not true, not in every line, um, but we exploit the structure of the poem uh, in the deep learning approach. And that actually was the breakthrough uh, to get us along. You know, we have only something like a few hundred or maybe a, up to a few thousand poems, um, but we have 10 times or 20 times as many lines um, in those poems together. So that actually advanced uh, us and allowed us to train uh, models um, that combine speech and text. And another aspect here was that we don't only look at how the speech looks like, but also what the pauses in between speech look like. So these are easily forgotten. You simply look at the speech itself, but now there was a pause in what I was saying, uh, and that may be significant in some way. Um, and we included that in our classification. Please and watch your time. We don't want to miss your conclusions. Yeah, I'm fine, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm at like five, right? Um, so um, overall, um, we uh, found that um, our classifier actually reflects the fluency of poetic styles. So although we had classes defined, um, those classes could be aligned on some sort of fluency, disfluency um, spectrum. And this is actually where the confusions of the classifier also showed. Um, and then we were able uh, to apply this classifier um, in a sort of humanist in the loop. Uh, there's the term human in the loop uh, in, in CS, but here it's a humanist in the loop who classifies and then we retrain the models and go on. Next slide, please. Um, so um, the collaboration experience was actually very, very interesting, uh, but also uh, um, highly controversial, let's put it that way. It's a clash of worlds uh, between, you know, well, we were supposed to be a D and an H person, but it was a CS and an H person. Um, and um, already things like empirically driven and theory driven um, can be argued about, right? Um, but if we talk about database humanities, um, I would say all truth is in the data. Uh, whereas often you would find a view that you have to have some theory um, to look at the data. And I'm pretty agnostic about theories. Uh, so we had wonderful discussions going on uh, for very long. Um, so whether you have something where you try to explore the data or where you, where you just quantify the data. Uh, and often it's a, it's a mix of both, uh, which we ended up in this humanist in the loop approach. Um, likewise for theory, uh, we can also argue about this. Um, we also, in our world, had a lot of 
um, technological issues, um, poems are just very, very hard and speech technology is just very, very bad at this stage. Um, so- um, It's my in, time. It's your timer. What, how many minutes am I supposed to speak? Five or 10? Ten. 10. Okay, but I didn't, I, like my timer says like 6.50, but okay. anyway. Um, so, um, so we actually traded a lot of work um, that would be interesting uh, for very simple work um, that the automatic approaches couldn't do. Um, so um, uh, next slide, please. So um, my conclusions and recommendation would be to communicate, um, to listen, to explain what you understood. Um, and if you don't understand, and that's, I guess, the most important part, uh, ask and ask again and again. Uh, we did this, uh, it was dreadful conversations. It took forever, uh, but it was, I think, uh, what made this project work. Um, sometimes when we disagreed on you know, theoretical backgrounds to approaches, we would agree to disagree uh, and then potentially just compromise on next steps. Uh, thank you very much.